Hi, um, in this lecture we're going to look at the production pipeline for a digital game and also the role of the game designer. <clears throat> um, there's four stages of a digital game production. These pretty much the same stages of uh, an analog game such as a board game uh, as well as the same stages. The uh, initial phase is the concept phase, you come up with the ideas pre-production phase, the production, and then the post-production. So I'll just break those down a little bit first. The concept. A few sentences describing what your game is. This goes back to the elevator pitch. It's the same thing, really. Um, the one I put up there, a card game for people who are into kittens and explosions and laser beams and sometimes goals. That is the concept for um, the Exploding Kittens card game, which was the most backed Kickstarter ever and the uh, most funded game ever on Kickstarter. Um, the pitch, a short summary document intended to present the game selling points and why the game would be profitable to develop. Uh, again, it's the elevator pitch thing. Um, the way I like to describe this is if you ever look at the back of a video game box, it's those bullet points on the back that promote your game. That, that's what you're writing. Um, in your pitch as part of your concept. So for the one, the example there, Gran Turismo 2, the world's more, it's promoting your game as well. It's all the great things that set your game out from uh, other games. The world's most advanced racing game returns. Um, the bullet points there are a bit small. It's uh, all vehicles designed according to their exact specifications, fully customizable, insane arcade mode, power slides, killer soundtrack, benchmark 3D graphics, uh, intense two-player racing. You know, you're really promoting it in a series of bullet points in, in your pitch statement. Um, then you get into pre-production, which is where the development team starts working together on the various aspects of your game. Um, a big part would be the storyline. Uh, the artist would start storyboarding up the narrative. Um, you would create a design document, which is a big part of it, which we will be going into more detail on how to create um, an effective design document. Um, what are the goals of the games? As we said in the first lecture, all games have goals. What are the goals? What are the short-term goals? What are the long-term goals? A long-term goal could be to rescue the princess. The short-term goal would be to finish the level. Um, the level design starts here as well, uh, maybe on pen and paper or maybe in a game engine if it's a, a digital game. Um, the gameplay mechanics, these are the game rules, which is the job of the game developer, uh, game designer, as um, we discussed in the last lecture. This is where you start uh, planning out what they are. Um, prototype as well, um, as this next slide says. Iterative design, prototype early, prototype often. Um, the sooner you can start playing your game, or not you as a designer. The designer of the game um, is usually the worst person to be playtesting the game because of the amount you're invested in it, involved in it, and you know how it works. It's all come out of your your mind. Um, you should be prototyping and game testing with people who haven't played the game, and getting their feedback and taking it on, and seeing what changes, seeing what works, seeing which bits are too hard, which bits are too easy, seeing whether they can understand the bits that they need to understand to get to the next part of your game. Um, the core design loops, which we'll be looking at. Um, this is usually started on with, uh, as the graphics uh, shows there. If you get some Dungeons & Dragons dice, a piece of paper and a pencil, you can do a lot with that um, to test your game. Um, if it's more of a digital game, say it's a, a platform game, Get into your game engine. Um, you don't need your fancy graphics at this point. You don't need the sounds in. Just use your uh, blocks or squares and get the gameplay. It's all about the gameplay. Um, gameplay is much more important than your fancy graphics and your aesthetics. Although they are important, um, people stay for the gameplay, um, which you can do just with blocks and cubes. Um, the next stage is production where if you're using a game engine, a pre-made game engine, if it's a, a digital game um, or some software to build it, you will start um, bringing in the assets into the engine itself. Um, the artist will be creating 
the 3D models, the 2D sprites, the audio engineers will be doing the sound effects. Um, the level designers will now be in the process of putting together the levels in <clears throat> the engine itself. Um, yeah, and this is where you build the game for release. And then the final stage is post-production after the game is released. Um, if you play video games at all, you'll see a lot it's more and more common as they're releasing not quite finished games because they're all to very strict deadlines and then afterwards they'll release these day one patches where it's a huge big patch to you have to, if you want the game to work in any way, you have to um, install this patch. Um, correcting bugs, some game breaking bugs, some games, some very major AAA um, titles have been released with game breaking bugs which they then go and patch. Uh, why? Because there's strict deadlines, because they have teams from all corners of the world um, working on the same game, um, and maybe there's been a lack of communication and they have a, a deadline date. Um, yeah, and then incremental functionality improvements, improving on the bits of the game, getting feedback off the wider audience. Um, there's only so much you can actually test um, using games testers in-house it's only when you release it to millions of people you see people might think well you could have done this better you could have done this differently um, improving it based on customer feedback um, the graphic there is from um, the Witcher Wild Hunt which is one of the biggest AAA titles of recent years um, after the game release they released two more um, downloadable um, content packages which basically added whole new chapters to the game and expanded the life of their game they already had all the mechanics in place they had a lot of the art assets so they just built on that and kept up their um, customer base to to buy this because they wanted to see more of this world where it was set that expansion was also very different than the core game because they'd seen what um, the customers liked um, and what they didn't like and so they built that based on the feedback that they got from the customers What is the role of a game designer? Um, at its very basic, um, a game designer crafts the core mechanics of the game. The mechanics being the rules. Um, the game designer creates the rules. The best um, example of that, I think, to get across that, like you're, you shouldn't be. You are creating the rules that the other members of the team then use to create the levels or to create the gameplay based on the rules that you've given them, which is the Dungeons and Dragons, that's a rule book. Use these rules to create amazing games, but you follow these rules. This is what happens when I attack this with this weapon. It does this much damage to this. These are the rules that the game designer will give to uh, the other members of the team. What skills does a game designer need to be good at? Pretty much everything. As the um, attached YouTube clip will say, everything you need to be good across the board. You need a knowledge of everything that your team's going to be doing. Um, you need a wide interest that you can draw on in various different things. Uh, anthropology, architects, art, cinematography, um, economics, engineering, uh, a lot of stuff is the answer to that. Pretty much everything. Communication would be the big one there, I think. You need to be able to communicate with the members of the team and get your ideas across to the different departments who will have very different ideas on how to um, take what you have given them and build something off it. The art department and the programming department will often be uh, very different on how they read into what you've given them. So the four basic elements of game design which all come together to uh, create the game uh, and should really all fit into your game in equal amounts and you should be looking at these four uh, elements saying, do I have enough aesthetics? Is the story fit with the aesthetics, uh, etc.? The mechanics, again, the rules, the story, the aesthetics, and the technology. Uh, so I'll just go through those a little bit. The mechanics, the procedures and rules of your game, describe the goal of your game, how players can and cannot achieve it, and what happens when they try. Um, that graphic is from um, the flow state which we'll be talking about, um, which I discussed in the last lecture, which is getting that balance right with the mechanics. Can the player understand the mechanics of your game? Um, 
Can they use the mechanics to move on to the next mechanics? Which mechanics do you need the player to understand to get to the next mechanics? Uh, how do they progress through this? Is the challenge always there for the player? Uh, the story. Um, the graphic there is one of the best video game stories, I think. Uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic was the whole story set in the Star Wars world with different characters and it really was an amazing story with some great twists in it. Uh, the sequence of events which unfolds in your game. It may be linear or branching and emergent. Um, a linear game, the player plays straight through and the story is exactly what the story is. Um, branching and emergent means that the story can change depending on the action of your player. Um, both work, both have their place. Uh, the aesthetics, uh, do they fit in with the world you're creating? Um, the aesthetics are how your game looks, how it sounds and how it feels. Um, they are very important to create the, um, the world that the player will be in uh, as they're playing the game. Um, the example there is Monument Valley, which was a big hit on mobiles. Um, the pastel colours, the muted uh, tones of this game, uh, the simplified characters really added uh, to the gameplay. Uh, the technology is one of the first things you should consider. Um, if you're making an analog game, a board game, the technology, you know, is you've got the board, you've got your cards. If you're working um, on a digital game, for instance, if you're working on a mobile game, designing and developing for a mobile game is very different. Uh, you don't have the, the joypads on a mobile, the processing power is less. Um, all these considerations have to be taken uh into account before you start develop, um, designing your game. So using the um, four elements, um, it's a very good diagram to look at and see how you're using them. Are they all being used to their full potential uh, to create the best uh, game you can? Um, are they in harmony, reinforcing each other and working towards a common theme? Uh, I'm going to use the example of Space Invaders to look at how the technology, mechanics, story and aesthetics work together to create um, a great gaming experience. Uh, the technology for Space Invaders, it was uh, custom designed for the game, a custom designed chipboard. It was um, 1978 this was released, so it was early in you know, the, uh, the technology of uh, video games. Uh, it's the first video game that allowed the player to fight an advancing army, and it was only possible due to a custom motherboard that was created for it. Um, an entirely new set of game mechanics was made possible with this technology. Uh, the gameplay mechanics of Space Invaders were new, it was interesting, it was well balanced. Um, it's shooting aliens that shoot back at them, they can hide behind shields. Furthermore, there's a possibility of earning bonus points by shooting the mysterious flying saucer. There's no need for time limit because the game can end in two ways. The player's ship can be destroyed by aliens, or the advancing aliens will eventually reach the home planet. Um, aliens closer are easier to shoot and worth fewer points. Aliens further away are worth uh, more points. Um, one of the interesting game mechanics was the more of the 48 aliens you destroy, the faster the army gets. This wasn't actually um, part of the design. It was because of the processor it could run faster with uh, less aliens on. Um, the story didn't have the game didn't have a story as such, but if you look at the case there, that told the story. Um, uh, the the cabinet itself. Um, the aesthetics, again, it looks dated by today's standards, but um, the design has actually got a lot out of such a, a small amount. Um, not all the aliens are identical, two different designs, they're worth different points. Um, the sound effects as well, everybody knows the um, Space Invaders sound, uh, that bump, 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 bump. It's, um, to this day, it's very um, much in culture. Um, so all the parts work together on, on this game. 